Thank you for attending today, everyone, and welcome to Wayne State University School of Medicine Second Look Day. We're excited to have you all as future warrior MDs. Uh, please bear with us for a moment. We're continuing to admit everyone into the main room. Um, so sit back and enjoy a brief video as we admit people. Thank you. And next up is Dr. Sprague, who will provide a brief introduction. He, Dr. Sprague is the Associate Dean of Admissions. I would like to thank everybody for joining us this uh, lovely uh, Friday afternoon. And I'd like to welcome you to uh, Wayne State School of Medicine Second Look Day. This is our largest second look uh, ever. I think we're pushing around 400 uh, members have joined us today. You'll have the opportunity to meet with the deans, faculty, staff, students to learn more about our school and Detroit. And I'd like to give this back to Jamie Krieger, who is our um, Director of Admissions and Enrollment Management Services. Jamie and her team work tirelessly and are extremely dedicated to your success, both pre-matriculation during your time at Wayne and after graduation. Jamie. Thank you, Dr. Sprague. We're briefly going to go over a few housekeeping items. Next slide, please. So a few reminders for today. Keep your microphones muted at all times. Make sure your name is fully displayed and use the chat function if you have any questions. Uh, due to the large participants that we're very excited about, it's best if we use the chat function to answer all questions. And all of the resources today and the PowerPoint that you'll be viewing, we will email that out to everyone after today's presentation. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce our Dean, Dr. Mark Schweitzer. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, and, and you all deserve a congratulations. Um, you should be very proud of yourselves. Um, I truly and sincerely hope that you'll continue your education here at Wayne State. Of course, it's an exceptional medical school. But wherever you go, you're an exceptional group of students. We picked you out of more than 10,000 applicants because of your intelligence, your character, and your hard work. But Wayne, like you are exceptional students, Wayne is an exceptional school. We have two missions. One mission is like every other school. I think we do a better job, but like every other school, is to train exceptional physicians. But we have a second mission, and that second mission is pretty unique to Wayne. It's to take care of those that others are unwilling or unable to take care of. And because of that experience, all Wayne State graduates of the rest of their careers. You can see that in our 99% match rate. You can see that in our rapidly ascending US News and World Report ranking. At the rate we're going, by the time you graduate, we'll be a top 50 medical school. And you can see that by our rapidly increasing, increasing NIH and other grant funding. We are a research university. We are a mission-based university. 
we are a public university and we are a university with an illustrious history. We are a heterogeneous university. Students from all backgrounds, all, all states, and many countries come here. And not only are we ranked high in US News and World Report as a research intensive medical school, we are ranked 24 for heterogeneity. If we are fortunate enough to have you come here and you are fortunate enough to get this exceptional Wayne education, you will continue 163 year history and 25,000 alumni. This is a great school. This is an exceptional school. And this is a unique school. And the purpose of today is to answer your questions and tell you how we're different than other medical schools. Thank you for your interest and congratulations on what you've all have accomplished. I'd like to introduce Dr. Richard Baker, our Vice Dean for Medical Education. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Schweitzer. So welcome all of you rising superstars. And again, superstars because the admissions committee saw something in you that made them feel that you could be part of our Wayne family. You could make an exceptional contribution. Our mission at Wayne is not to just train physicians, but it's to train physician leaders. Um, if you come to Wayne, you won't be a medical student. Day one, you'll be considered a physician in training. Again, uh, we train, our mission is to train physician leaders who are comprehensively educated to deliver 21st century care. More importantly, if you come to Wayne, you will be uniquely trained to provide high quality care in highly diverse, highly complex, and high acuity clinical and community environments. If you train at Wayne, you'll be prepared to practice anywhere, anytime, and in any situation. Wayne is Detroit's medical school. Our core value is social accountability. In recognition of being Detroit's medical school, we have named our new curriculum, the Highways Curriculum, is designed to be the pathway to urban clinical excellence. I will now hand you over to one of the main architects of this curriculum, exciting curriculum, Dr. Sentel Rajesh Sakari, our Senior Associate Dean for Undergraduate Medical Education. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Thank you, Dean Schweitzer. And um, welcome you all. And I would like to begin by saying I was almost similar to you in terms of crossroads of decide, uh, decide, deciding where I want to join. Uh, I joined Wayne State University School of Medicine last February, and I had an option to um, go to other medical schools at the same time while I was do, deciding on my career mode with my family. And we, I chose Wayne State University School of Medicine, and I cannot be more satisfied than um, now in, uh, about my decision. And I chose Wayne State University because of the opportunity to develop and train exceptional physicians. And I saw the uh, commitment all the way from the top leadership to the staff and the faculty to train our students and the commitment to the student success. And we have an incredible team, leadership, faculty, staff that's totally committed to uh, our student success. And we take pride in, our, um, in seeing students grow and accomplish great things even beyond uh, their time in Wayne State after they graduate. So it's my pleasure to present the curriculum that you'll experience here at Wayne State University School of Medicine. We have a four-year MD program that has three phases and um, the three phases are pre-clerkship, clerkship and post-clerkship phase. And within the pre-clerkship phase, there are two segments, segments one and segment two. And se the clerkship phase is segment three and pre post-clerkship phase is the segment four. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is overall a curriculum schema. As you can see, each uh, the segment one is about nine months long and segment two is about the next nine months long period. And within each segment, you have three large courses. In this case, it will be segment one, human body foundations one, two, and three. 
where you will be learning for the entire nine months, you'll be learning about the normal organ systems, which is the anatomy and physiology, biochemistry, normal functioning of organ systems. And then you'll have a month break in March, after which you'll come back and uh, re-engage in the, almost the same sequence of organ systems where you'll be learning the same organ systems in disease states and how to manage those conditions. So you have a two pass um, of the same organ systems that will reiterate your learning and will solidify your understanding of how the body functions normally and in disease states and how to address and how to manage those clinical conditions. In addition to that, we have uh, longitudinal courses, as you can see here, um, patient population physician, professionalism, service learning, clinical skills, and also um, electives. I'd like to spend some time on our electives where um, we are one of the fewer schools in the country that offer electives in the pre clerkship phase. You won't see that often. And this is a great opportunity for students to individualize their learning experience, especially for students like uh, all of you who want to do above and beyond what is uh, required of um, you as a bare minimum, right? So we have multiple electives that we can offer and I'll go through some of those in the, in the later point of the presentation as well. And then, um, we also have um, a, a course in the second, second year where you will be actually spending time in the clinical clerkships, in the clinical environment, in the presence of a physician, you'll be contributing to the care by uh, applying the skills that you learn in the classroom. Next slide, please. So we have restructured our curriculum for your class, class of 2025. Uh, based upon what we learn. We are uh, a learning organization that learns continually and also committed to continuous quality improvement. And based on our experiences in the past year and past years, we have restructured our curriculum to be uh, in this format that I just presented. You have uh, three 11 or 12 week blocks. You'll have one week that is dedicated for wellness and synthesis between each 11 or 12 week block during which there will be no curricular requirements during that time. Again, that's uh, one of the unique features of our curriculum that you, will, you, will not, you won't see commonly among medical schools where you'll have a dedicated time where you can synthesize the content and also engage in wellness with no curricular requirements between the curricular blocks. And there is a four week long break between segments one and two uh, where our students are currently uh, in right now. They are all, we are really excited to welcome back our segment two students next Monday. And uh, also the restructuring took into account the stress that the students have for high stakes exams. So there is no single high stakes exam in the curriculum. We have multiple mid stakes exams that are sprinkled across the coursework so that the students can afford to have one bad day and that won't ruin their um, course performance as a whole. And also we have formal program in place for students who have academic challenges. You are smart, you come in, and then you have a life event happen, and then you have difficulties with academics. We have a formal programming that has now actually data we have to shown to help students who are having academic difficulties. Next slide, please. There are a few additional highlights I would like to make while I'm still giving you a 2,000 or 5,000 foot view of our curriculum. Um, one of the highlights is early clinical exposure. We have state of the art, and I don't use the word state of the art lightly. We have a Cato Clinical Skills Center where you'll be um, practicing skills, interacting with uh, patients who are standardized patients and gaining clinical skills. Year after year, we receive feedback from our clerkships that our clinical skills faculty are doing an exceptional job in improving training for uh, our students as they enter clerkships. And then we also have the clinical experiential course where you will be spending time in the clinics as a second year medical student, taking history and contributing to the care of the patient. And also, as I mentioned earlier, we are committed to offering individualized curricular enrichment experiences and choices that includes electives in the pre clerkship phase and also in the uh, scholarly concentration program that I'll walk you through in a minute. One thing that I'm most proud of and this is one of the reasons what drew me to Wayne is the student activism here. I love working with students. They make me feel young, um, always. And um, they really push me to do new and creative and innovative things. So one of the things that I'm most proud of is working with the students and faculty alike to create a social justice curriculum. 
So as we speak now, we are one of the very few medical schools that I know of that are engaged in creating a formal curriculum around uh, racial justice, climate justice, and gender inequity, gender equity um, justice. And um, the curriculum management committee, which is the oversight committee for all the curriculum has actually created a subcommittee to just purely work on social justice curriculum. And, um, and also our faculty and students as we speak now are receiving trainings on uh, microaggressions. And that is just one small part of our commitment to social justice in the community. Next slide, please. We are really excited uh, to offer a business and medicine elective for your class. You'll, yours will be the first class. Um, our Dean Schweitzer has, has committed to a new programming that will enrich student experience here. And so we are in um, working relationship with our Mike Illich School of Business within Wayne State School of Medicine. And the first step towards the partnership is offering an elective where um, you'll have this whole elective focus on innovation and entrepreneurship and your class again will be the first class to receive this elective. Um, and it will be offered to eligible students in the first year after you join us and you'll be eligible to apply. And all of, all of you will be eligible to apply and select few who are selected for that will have um, the uh, opportunity to pursue this elective. And we also have um, initiated the Wayne Pathways Initiative where we offer individualized learning experience and enrichment opportunities for students who want to do above and beyond, which is um, an opportunity for you to engage in work with faculty mentors and engage in basic science at clinical research or pursue global health as a pathway or pursue medical education research as a pathway or um, pursue public health and community engagement or women's health or environmental health as a pathway for, for you. And each pathway has an end goal in terms of you generating a product and that product can be anywhere between um, you publishing a paper or presenting in a conference or presenting an abstract. And if you want more information that can be found in med.wayne.edu slash SC. And um, in terms of our, uh, you might have a question about resuming in-person activities. We have been working very closely with our public health committee in the main campus in Wayne State University to ensure that we, we are um, always having student safety and faculty and staff safety in forefront of what we do. At the same time, we also want your education to progress optimally. So um, what we have initiated a massive vaccination campaign for our students and our faculty and staff who are student facing. And we are ready to um, offer in-person activities. At least if the current situation continues, we'll be offering in-person activities for your orientation, for your gross anatomy labs, your clinical skills, service learning, and also the um, when you are in segment two, currently the clinical experiential course that um, you'll be attending as a segment two student. So if again, um, if the same situation continues, then we'll be, we are on track to offering these in-person experiences for you and you'll be receiving communications from us uh, periodically to make sure that you are informed about our plans for in-person activities for your class. Next slide, please. Yeah, with that, I would like to introduce our Assistant Dean for Clinical Education and um, colleague, Dr. Uh, Christopher Steffis, to present you the clinical education curriculum. All right. Thanks very much, Santhal. Um, if we go on to the next slide. So I'm limited to five minutes to talk about what I could be talking about for an hour or two hours and because I'm just so excited about how our um, clerkships and clinical education goes. Um, we are really excited this year because we are able to get to the new curriculum that we had been planning since 2015 or 2016 and shifting the clerkships and where the, um, the third and fourth years are back to what we had originally planned. And due to a lot of hard work by the um, class of 21, 22 and 23, uh, we were able to get through the uh, pandemic and uh, keep on schedule, which I think was uh, quite a testament to the resiliency of the school in keeping our students educating and helping out the patients um, in the hospitals and in the 
city of Detroit all the way through the pandemic. As uh, Dr. Rajasekharan said in uh, segment two, you get introduced to the, um, well, I guess my time is up. It's really moving pretty fast here. Can you go back a couple of slides? In segment two, you get some introduction um, to taking care of patients in the uh, clinical um, experience uh, course. And there you go out into uh, offices and see patients and really get used to the mechanics of taking care of a patient. And this, uh, <clears throat> this course really works. Our third year students uh, started this week. On Tuesday at clinic, uh, one of our students, I was happy to say when I told her to go in and see a patient, she came out, she saw the patient, had an assessment, a plan, just like she was taught and uh, did it well. And then she saw another one and then she saw another one. I said, boy, that second year course really works well. Anyway, for the uh, clerkships, we have three, uh, three months, actually 12 weeks of medicine and surgery. And um, then we have, um, could I still have you go back uh, two slides because I know this by memory, but I'd like everybody to see the, there we go. That's it, clinical rotations, up one. One more. Yes, stay there. All right, so you can see our rotations on the left side. It's fairly standard, uh, but we do have a longer internal medicine and surgery uh, blocks because these are the core of a lot of the knowledge and a lot of the core of what's on uh, step exams. We have an integrated uh, course that goes out throughout the um, 48 weeks of year three, uh, which is called CRISP, which stands for Clinical Reasoning Integration and Skills for Practice. And this is uh, put through the year and touches on topics that are important on each clerkship. Um, and we can add exciting programming there. We're in the second year of this and we're really excited about how this is coming around. You can see on the right side of the slide, the different clinical sites we have. Um, and we have students doing inpatient rotations at all these uh, sites and outpatient rotations too. We have uh, uh, affiliations with many uh, physicians around the city, around Southeast Michigan. Uh, we've uh, just started an um, association with the Michigan Health Professionals and many opportunities for uh, ambulatory uh, rotations in addition to the traditional inpatient rotations. Most of medicine is practiced outpatient these days and we are changing our curriculum to keep up with that. Now we can go to that last slide. After uh, 12 weeks of third year, we get to the really exciting part, which is our elongated fourth year or what we call the post clerkship phase. Again, this starts on April 1st. Our junior students are starting their senior year this week. Uh, there are clinical rotations that are mostly electives. We have required rotations in emergency medicine, which is a great rotation, one of the best emergency medicine rotations um, in the country, I would say. Uh, we have a sub-internship that you can do in various disciplines that you're going into. Um, we will have uh, rotations that are required in intensive care. <clears throat> we have step two prep. And we have a lot of clinical electives that uh, we really tailor to what you want to go into. Part of our 99% match rate uh, that we have is that during your senior year, you meet with one of the uh, uh, deans and senior faculty to go through your, um, your uh, performance evaluation, go through your letter and really get a lot of um, good advice. And we go spend a lot of time making sure that everyone has a schedule that supports their residency application. We have a couple of new things that we've added in the last couple of years. We have a residency prep course, uh, which the students are on now, the ones that have already matched, that gives them the ins and outs, the skills that they need to walk into residency and really be leaders um, in their uh, first year residency class. And this year we are expanding our Dr. Means teacher <coughs> curriculum to, uh, to all senior students. We have carried this on for a few years now where um, our senior students get education in how to educate and then practice that by helping underclassmen. So when you're a first year, there'll be a lot of fourth year students who are helping teach you uh, clinical medicine. We found this very effective. And just let me mention again, our 99% match rate that we've had this year. And I think it's really um, is a uh, product of a lot of work, uh, mostly on the students part and a lot of opportunities that they get here at Wayne. And with that, I will hand it over. to Dr. Wainio. Thank you, Dr. Stuffies. 
So um, what I'd like to do um, as a, I, I wear a number of different hats here. You'll see me in your preclinical and clinical curriculum, but I'm here representing the Office of Student Affairs right now. And what I'd like to do is share with you some of the pieces that create a supportive and a family-like atmosphere at our medical school. So what I hope you've been able to see thus far is that we are a group that works really well together. And we're joined in what is really both a passion and a goal to prepare our Wayne State medical students to be physicians. Um, and I know you're thinking about the next step of choosing a medical school, but, but it's, it's April right now. And so, you know, when I think about it, in four years, you're gonna be matched with a residency you're gonna be looking at the next step. And I think that's what our faculty does is um, we look for those years in advance for you too, to make sure that um, you get to that finish line. And here's a little bit about student life that helps you to meet your goal. So one of the great things about being a, a big medical school is all the students that we get to have. You know, there are 70 plus student organizations. There are AAMC student representatives. We've got a thriving mentorship program and we've got learning communities. So you can have basically the best of both worlds of being in what a large place offers as well as being able to be linked in smaller groups. So you really do get to know your colleagues. We do like to celebrate things at Wayne State from M1 orientation and the white coat ceremony, um, all the way through, there's, these are just a few of the highlights of ethnic fair, match day, and all the way through to commencement. But these are, these are big milestones that we like to celebrate together and in which the, student, uh, the Office of Student Affairs, as well as everybody here is intimately involved in. We also think that it, having a supportive environment is really important. Um, you're first and foremost people. Right, And so um, we recognize that in the four years, things happen. And so there may need to be accommodations. Some of you may need to have a leave of absence and a reentry plan. And this is also what the Student Affairs um, Office is here for. We have health and wellness that's really truly integrated within the curriculum, both for autonomous wellness, where you're able to have some time off, um, like was already discussed, as well as some summits where you're able to, for that part of the day, really focus on um, what it takes to stay well as a physician. We also have a lot of optional series of um, sessions that are run by students, that are run by faculty and run by the counselors. We've got a great group of people and we like to hear from you regarding what works for you and what you wanna see and any way that you wanna get involved in our wellness sessions. We've also got one-on-one -on -one advising sessions, one-on-one -on -one mentorships with faculty so that you can figure out what you wanna do as a physician in your future, as well as specialty advising dinners where you can meet with a group. They've looked a little different this past year over Zoom. Um, there's been less, less food, but a lot of really good conversation um, and a lot of uh, resources that we have so that you can figure out who you wanna be as a physician. And finally, the last step of residency preparation, whether it be like Dr. Steffi's mentioned from that medical student performance evaluation, one-on-one -on -one meeting to mock interview sessions with our faculty so that you're prepared for interview season. So with that, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Allen, who's a clinical associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics. She's the course director of Population, Patient, Physician, and Professionalism, which is one of my personal favorite courses at the medical school. I'm a, a Wayne State alumni myself, and a continuity clinic preceptor and preceptor for the pediatric clerkship during segment three. Thank you, Dr. Wainio, and good afternoon to all of you. I am delighted to be here. It's no easy feat, and it shows some of the dedication the faculty, I think, have for Wayne State, because I'm in the middle of clinic right now and have a couple of patients that I need to go see, but they are understanding, and this is a teaching clinic, and they're happy and excited and understanding that we are very much dedicated to our students at Wayne State, so happy to be here. I wanted to give some highlights for the course. Um, you all know, uh, as I also presented during the initial look about population, patient, physician, and professionalism, it is a two-year course. We have small groups, we have facilitated groups, we have interprofessional group learning. Um, we have an opportunity to really digest the why and how of what it means to be a physician practicing in an urban environment. 
we go to the next the next slide. Thank you. So what I wanted to do was highlight a few of the things that the students did in our course because it would give you a great description of how we've changed our course and how this is relating. Um, during the first year, we talked about the upstream downstream theorem by um, Dr. Irving Zola, who's a medical sociologist, and talk about really the public health impacts of medicine. The students had an opportunity to digest some of that. We spoke more about um, the actual, we, it's the year that we have. So we had to talk about bias and racism in medicine and how that impacts students. And Detroit has a very rich history um, and sometimes not so rich in terms of riots and how the medical system was involved. So the students were able to take a deep dive on how our Detroit Medical Center, which is home of Wayne State University, was involved in helping out during the race, the race riots of Detroit. And then the third approach is we looked at healthcare delivery system where we partnered up with our local LGBTQ plus clinic um, at Corktown and we had their staff come out and talk about how healthcare is delivered to a particular population and how that is expanded to other populations who are in the Detroit area. This slide that you're seeing is some of the products from our second year. So they've mastered all of this content and this particular unit talked about either correctional health or um, homelessness in medicine. So we have patients or our students looking at criminalizing the criminalization of mental illness and how that might present in clinic as we are seeing our patients. And then again, you see um, women's health and federal prison and how that's impacted. And then finally, we're looking at LGBTQ health and how that's very um, similar to what we might see from a patient who is homeless because of both populations being equally likely to be displaced within the city and how that would actually appear in our clinics. We not only want the students to understand the social determinants of health that um, impact health outcomes, but we want them to understand the community resources. And by doing that, they have to research that. And when they come to our clinic, you're not only saying, hey, here's the regular problems that we see, but in terms of a comprehensive approach to medicine, they're also equipped to help to direct patients in the correct direction in that regard. With that, I hope to be back a little bit later as soon as I'm done with clinic, but I, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Jennifer Mendez. She is an associate professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and Division of Geriatrics. She is also the Director of Community Engagement and the Course Director for Service Learning at the Medical School. She is currently joining us from Toronto. So, Thank you, Dr. Mendez, for being here, and I hope to be able to speak to you all a little more later. Thank you, Dr. Allen. It's a pleasure to be a part of this esteemed university, and uh, it's my uh, in, I enjoy our students, and I'd like to take, take you on a little ride for two minutes about what we do in service learning in the community. Next slide, please. Um, we connect with the community agencies and the student-run clinics that Dr. Venio explained to you about. There are over 70 of them, but to do that, we uh, control how it is invested into the Detroit community. So we use our School of Medicine mission to direct us. We look at social justice, uh, as well as uh, the health of our students, as well as the health of our community. We, as future, physicians, you are caring for a very diverse population with a lot of emotional needs, especially at this time when um, we are engaged mostly online with the community. All students in at Wayne State complete 35 hours of service learning in year one and 35 hours of service learning in year two. Nick, please go to the next slide. Next slide. Um, in supporting our community, right now we have students that are assisting with COVID testing and vaccine distribution. We started doing this um, on Martin Luther King holiday, January 18th. And as of today, we probably have done over 5,000 hours of uh, volunteering with the City of Detroit Health Department. A class of 2023 has been engaged with both uh, African-American communities as well as our Latino communities who were impacted by the COVID-19 uh, job losses. In fact, one of our uh, student teams was working with a family who lost 
not only her mother, her father, and she herself got COVID. The students engaged in creating and helping her with funeral arrangements for her parents. This was above and beyond what was expected of a medical student, but that shows you that we have a whole rounded curriculum in terms of community engagement and service learning. We also have an interprofessional program where our students visit homes of adults 50 plus, and they do that with our pharmacy, OT, nursing, PA, dental, um, physical therapy, athletic therapy, and social work students. But this year we had to do it by Zoom. And in order to do that, they had to teach the patients how to use Zoom. And we have a 90 year old who communicates with me every weekend to let me know she went to the opera because the students taught her how to use Zoom to get to the opera. We also in the class of 2024 were concerned about the misinformation about health needs in the community, especially during a pandemic. And our students created um, myths related to COVID-19. And I will have that link shared with you, but you can you take a look at those. The myths that they created were for families to use with their children, as well as for adults to use it among themselves. We have offered this program to anybody who'd like to um, view the myths and we had 300 people that attended. And I thank you for taking this time and I'll explain more when we're in the breakout rooms. And at this time, I'd like to introduce one of our students uh, from the class of 2024. Annie um, is from Farmington Hills, Michigan and is a first year medical uh, warrior. He is the director of our diabetes he is the director of our community homeless interprofessional program clinic. He, in addition, he has been engaging with a number of his peers in a telehealth um, national program for, uh, in order for us to introduce telehealth to your class in the next few months. Thank you, Annie, for the time you're giving us today. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Mendez. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Anirudh. I also go by Ani. Uh, as Dr. Mendez said, I'm from Farmington, and I went to high school uh, in the suburbs of Detroit before uh, doing my undergraduate at Cornell University in upstate New York. And I just completed my first year of medical school about three years ago. I'm in the kind of four week break between segment one and segment two right now that Dr. Roger Sakron was talking about earlier. Um, and yeah, I will be talking today about, you know, life in general in Detroit as a student, uh, as well as a little more specifically introducing various types of student organizations that the School of Medicine has to offer, like Dr. Wania was mentioning earlier. Uh, so in terms of transitioning from a uh, undergraduate to a first year student, it was definitely a little difficult being a part of the class of 2024, <clears throat> entering medical school in the midst of a pandemic but I was really appreciative of the Wayne State School of Medicine community as a whole for making a really solid effort uh, to make sure that we can still kind of uh, start off strong in the midst of all these obstacles. Um, and I was also very grateful for the student body for being very um, collaborative and friendly. Um, I was kind of worried about starting medical school in the middle of a pandemic and not being able to connect with my classmates or anything. But um, as I'm sure a lot of you have experienced already through like the Facebook group and group me and things like that, our student body as a whole tends to be very collaborative and friendly. So um, it made the transition a lot smoother for me. Um, <clears throat> in terms of where to live in Detroit, um, I'm from a suburb of Detroit. And so I wasn't entirely sure if I was gonna have the opportunity to live downtown or live closer to the school in Detroit. Um, but thankfully, as the pandemic kind of died down a little bit and in-person activities resumed in our medical school, I moved downtown to Midtown, but there's also a lot of other communities uh, to live in around the city, including New Center, Riverfront, uh, Corktown, and Greektown, which are all various uh, cultural centers around the city of Detroit. There's also a lot of people that I know in my class and the classes above me who live in uh, Royal Oak or Ferndale or Gross Point, which are all suburbs of Detroit that are around 15 minute drive away, um, which isn't too bad. Um, 
in terms of activities, there's a lot of stuff to do in Detroit. Um, being from the suburbs, I definitely uh, knew a lot more about the city than some of the out-of-state kids did, but uh, actually living in the city for around eight months now, I've definitely felt a lot more connected to the city, and I feel like I've definitely had the opportunity to kind of experience all that Detroit has to offer. Um, the medical school campus being located in Midtown is literally a 10 minute walk away from uh, all four major sports teams locations in Detroit, which is great. I'm a huge Detroit sports fan. Um, in addition to that, Detroit has a really big theater scene and art scene uh, with the Majestic Theater, Fox Theater, Fisher Theater. Uh, there's lots of concerts and uh, comedy shows and uh, theater productions, et cetera, that are held downtown pretty regularly and should be opening up relatively soon. Um, there's also a really big restaurant scene in Midtown as well as downtown. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised at that because I the only the only times I would personally come all the way down to Detroit from where my family lives in high school was if my parents were taking me out to a really nice restaurant. But living down here, I was actually able to experience a lot of the cool um, restaurants that are in Midtown, uh, like in Mexican Town as well, um, and a lot of breweries and bars and things like that. Um, and I was able to kind of explore all of these things with people in my class and it was great. Um, in addition to that, there's a lot of outdoor activities that you can do in the city of Detroit. Um, there's a lot of biking trails and paths and stuff like that, including Dequinder Cut, uh, Belle Isle, which is like a 10 minute drive from Midtown, which is like this island that's kind of uh, between the city of Detroit and Canada, has like a lot of um, parks and things like that. Um, there's also a lot of activities in Midtown, including uh, a museum district with the DIA, as well as um, a lot of, you know, bowling alleys and axe throwing facilities and various different activities to do. So life is definitely very interesting in Detroit. Um, so yeah, now I'm going to move on to talk about student organizations. So Dr. Wainio kind of introduced how there's 70 plus organizations in our large med school, but this is kind of a rough way to break them into sort of groups. So starting off with the clinical organizations, a lot of these um, are like student run free clinics that provide uh, very important healthcare services to the uninsured and homeless population in Detroit. Um, I am uh, involved with CHIP clinic. I'm one of the clinic coordinators. And basically uh, through these clinics, you can kind of, uh, provide care to the uninsured as well as uh, fulfill prescriptions um, and kind of conduct uh, just general physical visits. There's also a lot of student organizations involving the community such as Gleaners or Auntie Nas, which kind of help with student education and uh, providing resources to the community. Um, there's also various interests and cultural groups such as the Black Medical Student Association and uh, various interest groups such as emergency medicine or neurosurgery that kind of help you connect with people working in that field for you know research or mentorship or things like that. Uh, there's also the student senate which allows you to kind of uh, interact with the School of Medicine faculty uh, as a part of all these subcommittees and really have a say on um, different issues or um, concerns within the School of Medicine. Uh, there's also a lot of professional groups that you can get involved in that are kind of national or state organizations where you can kind of connect to other schools or um, other groups of students across the country. And finally, there are talent groups such as acapella groups or orchestra or um, things like that. So yeah, in general, there's a lot of student organizations here at Wayne and um, almost everyone that I know is involved in at least two or three of these organizations. It's a lot of fun and it's definitely one of the like big factors uh, that drove me toward Wayne is getting involved in these different types of organizations. So yeah, that's all I have to say really. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat during the breakout room and I'll try to address them. And also I'll send my email in the chat in case you have any questions for me, feel free to reach out. And last but not least, there's an ambassador event at the uh, end of the month where we will be addressing more questions from the student body. So if you'd like to attend that, uh, definitely do that. So thank you for your time and I'll hand it over to Jamie. Thank you, Ani. Um, I'll remind everyone again that a copy of this presentation will be emailed out to everybody. And that's important because we'll be getting into financial aid and scholarships. And I know that you'll all be looking for details on that. Um, so I'll start off by giving a large overview and then we'll hand it off to our financial aid team. Next slide, please. 
So the different kind of buckets of scholarships, if you think of them or that this way, are we have need-based, there's merit-based, there's ones that have both a need and merit component, and then there's external scholarships. And those break into a couple different categories. There's general um, external scholarships, and those come from different outside organizations like community foundations, um, like the AAMC um, has external scholarships. And then there are service-based um, external scholarships. A few of them are listed here and we'll have more details on those on an upcoming slide. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit more information. So need-based, we have institutional need-based uh, scholarships. We need you to file a FAFSA to be considered for those. And we have sent out messaging on how to file a FAFSA and what the Wayne State School Code is to help you with that. Um, we have need-based endowed scholarships um, that have been provided by donors to our school. Um, the uh, scholarship committee here in medical education reviews all of the information on your FAFSA and the donors criteria and awards those on an annual basis. Uh, we have merit-based scholarships for incoming students. Um, we've handed all of those out to date. If you're a recipient so far, congratulations. And we have merit-based endowed scholarships that are handed out on an annual basis based on academic performance. Um, we have ones that cover both criteria and our scholarship committee reviews your need and your academic performance to award those. And some of those are very specific to different years in school. There's a segment um, based for each year in the program. And we will open up a scholarship application for any that require a specific application. And you'll be getting that right before you transition in in July in your email. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit on service commitment programs. If you've never heard of these, these are great opportunities. Um, to start off with, we have the Health Profession Scholarship Programs. These are military medicine, um, Army, Navy, and Air Force all have programs. We'll be emailing this out to you so you can have the hyperlinks if you're interested in checking these out. The VA also has a Health Profession Scholarship Program, um, National Health Service Corps, um, the United States Public Service Commission Corps, and civil service programs. And there's quite a few under that umbrella, including the Indian Health Service, uh, the CDC, uh, the National Institute of Health, and National Health. Um, all of these do require some form of a service commitment in exchange for scholarship dollars, um, but I encourage everyone to check these out. Next, I'm going to hand it off to two faces that will become very familiar to you, um, Dr. Barbara Jones and Adam Zangerly, two of our financial aid officers here at the School of Medicine. Thanks, Jamie. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I'm just going to go over the financial aid process that we follow here. Um, at this point in the year, you're going to want to go ahead and do your FAFSA if you have not done that before. This is for all students who are U.S. citizens or permanent residents. Do the FAFSA online at studentaid.gov. Once that done, you can review your student aid report which the school is also gonna get. And for all the admitted students who have listed Wayne State, we're going to send out award letters, which you would view electronically on the academic account. Go ahead with the next slide. Um, the academic account at Wayne State, academica.wayne.edu, you will view your terms and conditions, accept that, and then you can review your student aid award, which will include any of the scholarships that Jamie talked about and federal student loans. There's also an additional grad plus loan that students use um, that can be in, used in addition to the federal unsubsidized loan. This, um, you're gonna get a tuition bill, but uh, go back one slide, please. The last part of this slide is gonna be explains the, the tuition bill. For all admitted students, you're gonna get a tuition bill sometime um, between June and the start of July. If you're paying for the bill yourself, that tuition bill is gonna be due about July 15th. If you're using student loans and or scholarships or a combination of both, you, you don't have to pay the tuition bill up front. The financial aid will be dispersed from your account and applied to your tuition. Um, there's more steps to the process, which we can go over in detail later but that's the general overview. So next slide, please. This uh, chart, which is also available on our website, 
gives the breakdown of the need-based grants that the university offers to students, which is a four-year renewable scholarship that ranges in be, uh, between $2,000 and $18,000 per year, which will be applied to um, your outstanding tuition charges. The, the way that this is determined is based on the amount of uh, need-based financial aid each student received as an undergraduate, uh, basically the amount of Pell Grant that you use. Also, we take into consideration students that used uh, federal student loans to determine it. So if you are a, a eligible for one of these grants, in addition to any merit scholarships you get, this will appear on your academic uh, account along with your student loans. Uh, go ahead for the next slide. Um, you're going to want to go ahead and review your student loan history. If you had any loans as an undergrad, we encourage you to, to view that at studentaid.gov. Um, prior student loans will, as long as they're federal student loans, are going to be able to be um, in an in-school deferment status. Um, so you will not have to make any payments on any prior student loans. Just make sure that your status is updated. Uh, next slide. Um, we always encourage smart borrowing for students we want to make sure that they create a budget, project your loan needs. We don't want you to borrow more than you need, but the, the, the amount that you're eligible for is designed to cover tuition and living expenses. We do have uh, additional one-on-one -on -one financial transition counseling avail available through the school. Um, we're, right now we're virtual. These would be done via Zoom or phone call. And we're always available during the school year when we're back in campus for um, any financial questions that the student has. Uh, go ahead for the next slide. Um, financial aid does not cover students' prior credit card debts. If you had any private student loans and the purchase of a new vehicle, we get these questions. So the financial aid that you receive through the FAFSA and the school is designed to pay for your current tuition charges and living expenses. If you have any of the, these other expenses, their financial aid is not designed to uh, cover these types of expenses. Go ahead with the next slide. Our contact information is available here. Uh, we're also going to be in the chat um, in the breakout rooms afterwards, myself and Dr. Jones. Um, we are 100% virtual right now. So if you want to make an appointment, go to our website, sign up for a uh, appointment. We'll do a callback or a Zoom call. Um, and answer any specific questions that you have. Next slide. I'm gonna introduce Fallon Lindsay, Enrollment Manager in, in Enrollment Management Services uh, with additional information. Good afternoon, everyone. Many of you have already had the opportunity of meeting with me. Um, for those of you who have not met with me just yet, uh, fear not. We are scheduling appointments throughout the entire school year. Um, so you guys will definitely have a opportunity to meet with me and to get some really great information. Um, next slide, please. So during our one-on-one -on -one sessions, we talk a lot about debt management. Um, I provide you guys with tools and resources um, just to kind of help mitigate getting into any uh, credit card debt specifically, um, just because there really is no money in your budget available for uh, paying off credit cards each month. So we sit down and we have a very good conversation about um, debt management and what happens if you are to get into any debt. Um, we do talk about the food assistance options. Um, one option is definitely our W Food Pantry that's available to you, to all students as well as the state of Michigan, um, their MI Bridges, Bridges program. And we also do talk about the different options for utility bill assistance. Um, if you're ever in a situation and you cannot afford to pay your utility bills, um, there are some community agencies available to you as well. Um, and then there are also some state programs available. We talk about housing resources, um, specifically university-based housing and kind of just the options around that. I also do encourage students to um, get with other students and to become roommates um, just because there really isn't a lot of money in your budget for um, rent outside of maybe eight to $900 per month. 
Um, and so especially if you're in the city of Detroit near the university, there's just not a lot of options available um, in that price range. So we do sit down and talk about the budget and the housing resources that are available to you as well. Um, we do talk about transportation. Um, during our session, we will also kind of review just some transportation options for you, um, whether or not you have a vehicle, what your action plan is for getting a vehicle. Um, and then if you need to make repairs to that car, what are your options as well? And then you'll also um, get information from me regarding childcare, the expense form associated with that, as well as info on the university-based childcare system. And then computer expenses, we do spend some time covering that as well. Um, this is kind of just a brief overview, but um, we definitely are here for all of our students. Our goal is to set up all of our um, students so that they can be successful. Um, again, if you have had the opportunity to meet with me, Thank you again for your time. Um, and then for those of you who I have not been able to meet with yet, I look forward to meeting with you. Um, at this time, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Jamie Krieger. And she is going to take us to the breakout rooms. Thank you, Fallon. Uh, before we join the breakout rooms, I'm going to introduce Kaylee Port, our marketing manager, and she's going to give us a break and engage us in a fun social media opportunity. Hi, everybody. I hope everyone is having a great time and got a lot of great information today. So I'm going to stop sharing just for a second so I can see all of your lovely faces. Um, so we want to just do something really fun where you guys kind of wave at the camera so I can put the boomerang on there. Again, no pressure. You do not have to have your camera on. If you don't have your camera on, no worries. But give me one sec just to get us set up and get as many faces on here as I can. Um, and all right, guys, give me two seconds and get the boomerang up. And I appreciate your patience and all of that. All right. Okay, everybody. So give me some awesome waves and let's keep going. Keep waving, keep waving. Sorry, camera is dirty. There we go. Beautiful. You guys look fantastic. All right, thank you so much. All right, I will hide myself and kick it back over to Jamie. Thank you, Kaylee, and thank you everyone for participating in that. Um, we're about to go into breakout rooms. Everyone will participate in all three breakout rooms. We are going to assign you to the room, so there's nothing you need to do, and our facilitators will come to you. Um, everyone will get a chance to completely sit through all three rooms and all three presentations and panels. Um, so no need to worry that, and you'll have more time to ask more individual questions to the presenters in those rooms. So I will hand it back to Kaylee and Bianca, who will start uh, arranging us in breakout rooms.